Good morning. Good morning. Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost. The theme for our worship is the law does not benefit God, it benefits us. Um, in particular, we'll be studying the Sabbath law. Uh, we are following the common service this morning. Uh, it begins on page 15 if you're following in your hymnal, otherwise your service is printed for you. Uh, since we are receiving the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll begin with a confessional hymn, hymn 305. Confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity, but I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to God. first lesson this morning, our words from Deuteronomy, we read from chapter 5. This is God speaking to his people from Mount Sinai. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day, the word of the Lord. The psalm for this second Sunday after Pentecost is Psalm 126. We will sing in unison. Thank you. 
letter to the Galatians, we read from chapter 2. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. Alleluia. for the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for the second Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Mark's gospel chapter 2. We begin at verse 23. Glory be to you, O Lord. These words will also serve as a sermon text. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll now make a confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life for the world to come. Amen. We'll now sing four verses of hymn 285.
Grace and peace are yours through a knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of our Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, dear friends, come back with me for a moment to Golgotha. Do you remember how Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus rushed to get Jesus' lifeless body off the cross and into a tomb that was nearby? Why were they so rushed? Because the Sabbath was approaching and they did not want to violate it. The same could be said of the women who went to the tomb early on Sunday morning. They were going to the tomb early that Sunday morning to anoint Jesus' body because they had not had the opportunity on Friday because the Sabbath was approaching and they did not want to violate it. The Pharisees refused to go into Pilate's court because they did not want to break the Sabbath. The Jewish people were very careful in their observance of the Sabbath, some for the correct reasons, some for the wrong reasons. Jesus helps us understand exactly what the Sabbath is and the correct observance of it. During a confrontation with the Pharisees in a grain field, Jesus revealed the true purpose of the Sabbath. He lets us know its purpose was not to save people, but its purpose was to give people rest. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on a Sabbath? Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. On Mount Sinai, God gave his people this command. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, and you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Let's define a couple of important words in God's command. The word Sabbath, you probably know, means rest. And the seventh day would be our Saturday. God's command could be summarized this way. As God rested on the seventh day and ceased his creating activity, so God's people, the Jewish people, would rest on the seventh day and do no work. God was very serious about the fact that his people should do no work on the Sabbath day. There is an incident from recorded in the book of Numbers that demonstrates just how serious God was that his people should not work on the Sabbath. Listen to these words of Moses. While the Israelites were in the desert, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord commanded Moses. We are left with no doubt. God did not want his people working on the Sabbath. On a certain Sabbath, the Pharisees, who were always two steps behind Jesus, saw Jesus and his disciples walking through a grain field, and they observed that Jesus' disciples were picking heads of grain to steal or to still their hunger. <clears throat> When the Pharisees saw the disciples doing this, they accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath. In their minds, what the disciples were doing, picking those heads of grain, 
was equal to reaping, threshing, and winnowing, which were to them a violation of the Sabbath. The Pharisees held to a very strict and legalistic following of God's law, including the Sabbath law. They did this because in their minds, keeping the Sabbath law and all of God's other laws was a means to merit God's favor and grace and to obtain their salvation. In their minds, the stricter a person kept the Sabbath and all of God's laws, the more that person deserved to be saved. The Pharisees' interpretation of the law, including the Sabbath law, put the Jewish people in a straitjacket, if you will. It enslaved them to the law. They felt like they had to do it in order to be saved. As Jesus diagnosed that the Pharisees' interpretation of the law made it seem like man was made for the Sabbath. In the Pharisees' opinion, man was made to serve the Sabbath in order to merit God's favor and grace and to obtain salvation. But that is not at all what God intended when he gave his law. God's law was never given to people so that they might save themselves by it. Jesus would now go on to reveal the true meaning of the Sabbath. Its purpose was not to save people, but its purpose was to give people rest. Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus exposed the... Pharisees' misinterpretation of God's law and their fallacy, the fallacy of their accusation against his disciples by referring to an Old Testament incident. The incident involved David and his companions who were fleeing from King Saul who was intent on killing them. It happened during the high priesthood of Abiathar the high priest. When David and his companions were on the run, they became hungry, and they appealed to the high priest Abiathar for food. The only food that was available was the consecrated bread, Jesus calls it. It's also known as the bread of the presence. In the tabernacle, in the holy place, the tabernacle simply being the place where Jews worshipped before the temple was built, in the tabernacle, in that holy place, there was a golden table. And on that golden table, there was placed every Sabbath 12 loaves of bread, one for each of the 12 tribes. Those Those loaves sat on that table. Until the next Sabbath, when those loaves were removed and fresh loaves were put on the table, The ones that were removed were to be eaten by the priests, but only by the priests. No one else was allowed to eat that bread. Since there was no other food, Abiathar gave David and his companions five of those loaves, and they ate them. David and his companions technically violated God's law. Yet, David and his companions were not condemned for eating it. And Abiathar was not condemned for giving it to them. By recalling this incident, Jesus was showing the Pharisees that in some cases, human need outweighs religious ritual. By recalling this incident, Jesus was pointing out to the Pharisees that they were wrong. That the God, that God's laws, including the Sabbath, were not given to enslave people, nor given to them so that they might save themselves through them. Jesus was pointing out that the Sabbath was, or man was not made for the Sabbath. To show the Pharisees that he had the authority to say this, he reminded the Pharisees that he was the Lord 
of the Sabbath. As God, he had instituted the Sabbath. And as God, he could determine what could and could not be done on the Sabbath. He reminded the Pharisees that what he had permitted his disciples to do had the full approval of God. And that is the Lord of the Sabbath. He would not allow his disciples to do anything that would violate the Sabbath. Jesus had proved it. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Instead, Jesus will point out the Sabbath was made for man. When God instituted the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and he commanded his people not to work, it was surely for a physical reason. He was giving his people and their animals a day off, a day to rest and refresh and to recuperate. But as with all of the ceremonial laws, this law of the Sabbath was a shadow of the things that were to come with the reality found in Christ, as Paul wrote in the second lesson. The Sabbath law would find its true fulfillment in the Savior. The Sabbath law pointed the people ahead to the rest they would receive through the Savior, the rest given to them through the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus wrote about that in the book of Matthew. He spoke this way in the book of Matthew. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Sabbath also pointed the people ahead to another rest, their eternal rest. It pointed them ahead to heaven where they would rest from all the struggles of this life and the consequences of their sins. Listen to the words of the writer of Hebrews. He describes this rest. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Indeed, as Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man. It was made to remind believers of the spiritual and eternal rest that they possess through Christ. But what does it matter to us at all? The Sabbath law, along with all of the other ceremonial laws of the New Testament, or the Old Testament, excuse me, were abolished. When Christ came and fulfilled them all with his life and death, what does it matter? Paul wrote in the second lesson, God forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. It doesn't matter for us. Sabbath day certainly is not for us New Testament believers, but in the spirit of the Sabbath, we still take a day and set it aside to hear the word of God, to be refreshed, to be spiritually refreshed, to be reminded of the spiritual blessings we have, the forgiveness of sins through Christ and our eternal rest in heaven where we will rest from all of our struggles and the consequences of our sin. However, we must beware of the legalism that plagued the Pharisees. Does our church attendance sometimes become something we do for God? Have you ever said to yourself with pride, I go to church every week? I haven't missed a service in years. Maybe our church attendance has become a work we do for God. Instead of letting the day be a benefit to us, as God intended. Does that sin give your soul unrest or any of your other sins? There's rest for you. There's rest for your guilty souls through your Savior, Jesus. He kept that Sabbath law perfectly, along with all of God's other laws to make up for our every violation of it. And on that Friday before the Sabbath, the day we call Good Friday, 
He suffered God's anger and torture of hell. And he died as a payment for our sins. Now through faith in him and his sacrifice for us, we have rest for our guilty souls through the forgiveness of our sins. And we look forward to our eternal rest where we will rest forever from all the struggles of our lives and the consequences of our sins. Heaven, where we will rest forever in God's glory. We find great joy in the words John heard recorded in heaven, or spoken in heaven, recorded in his revelation. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor. The Sabbath law does not apply to you. But be thankful for it. Be thankful for the peace it promised and which you possess in Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue by praying responsively the prayer of the church. It begins on page number seven in your worship folder. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Work in us so that we believe and live the word we have heard today. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move, Move us to love all ministers of the word wherever they serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. 
Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make law and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner who repents and is brought to trust in you. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed to your love in Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Help us all be worthy communicants who trust that their sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will continue with the order of service for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Oh, Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. Take drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for, for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This true body and this true blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day of life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. This is the true Take blood of our Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of
Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This true body and this true blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day of life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This true body and this true blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day of life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. and join me in singing the song of Simeon.
give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Holy Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen. 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 We will conclude this morning with hymn 183. You may be seated. <coughs> difficult sermon text I've ever worked on, just so you know. That was, that was difficult. I have been a chicken up until this point in my ministry. I have skipped that sermon text for 30 years. You did well. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Ah, yeesh. Anyway, um, just a couple of things. Thanks to Gus for helping out this morning. He's going to be here all summer, so you'll get to see his lovely face uh, lots this summer, so we appreciate that. Um, we're going to need a Sunday school teacher for our upper grade students in the fall. You see what I wrote in the bulletin there? If you think you can do that, uh, pray about it and talk to me. I'd appreciate it. Uh, the annual church cookout is next Sunday after the service. Uh, meat will be provided. You're asked to bring a dish to pass uh, for the potluck. Uh, the rest of those things you can look at and put on your calendar. Um, I was also reminded that the greeter sign-up sheet is blank for the next two months, so if you feel moved to be a greeter, uh, we would certainly appreciate it very much. I think that's all I have. Um, oh no, there's one more thing. The flower bed by the retaining wall, out the back doors. Can anybody take care of that? I would, but I don't know what's a flower and what's a weed. 
I really don't. But it's, uh, okay, because it, it's an awful look for the house of the Lord. When people come and, and see that, that's just terrible. And I'm not trying to force anybody to do it or motivate you with the law. Just, if someone could look at it, I'd certainly appreciate it. But now I have nothing else. Anybody? All right, thank you very much. God bless your day. Thank <laughs> you.